Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's briefing on nature-based resilience for Gulf state communities. Thank you for joining us here on Capitol Hill and uh, those of you streaming online. I'm Ellen Vaughn, and I'm with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI is a bipartisan 501c3 um, not-for-profit organization. We're based here in D.C. And we have been bringing fact-based, um, science-based information to the policymaking process for about 35 years now uh, through briefings like this, fact sheets, and other activities. We're funded primarily by uh, foundation grants and charitable contributions, for which we are extremely grateful. And I have the honor of I introducing our expert panel, who will discuss the extreme weather impacts specific to the five states along the U.S. Gulf Coast. And those are Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, <laughs> Louisiana, and Texas. Um, but they're also going to um, talk about the innovative, sustainable, and hopeful uh, solutions that are making shorelines and communities uh, safer, more resilient, and better prepared for the next storm. Um, so um, after we hear from the panel, and also um, in addition to our panel, we are um, thinking that we will be uh, visited by Congressman Charlie Crist. Um, so we'll just kind of pause and let him come to the podium um, when he arrives. Um, so uh, I will introduce the panel and then I'll uh, each um, one by one, uh, each panelist. And then uh, after the panel, we'll open it up to your questions. So if you can kind of keep note of those and keep those. Um, we will have those at the end, and we usually try to leave, um, you know, 30 minutes or so if we can. So um, we'll go ahead and get the panel started. Uh, one thing I um, uh, did want to mention is uh, that we're also very delighted to work with um, so many wonderful offices here on Capitol Hill. I know uh, congressional staff are overwhelmed with so many issues, expanding portfolios. Uh, so we really appreciate your time and hope that we can be a resource to you. Um, so I would love to start by introducing Sarah Murdoch. Uh, Sarah serves as the director of U.S. Climate Resilience and Water Policy at the Nature Conservancy. Her 30-year career has spanned work in the public, private, and now nonprofit sector on environmental and energy policy. Currently, she manages the development implementation of the Conservancy's climate, resilience, and water-related policy positions uh, with a focus on disaster, disaster risk policy. She holds a BA in environmental science from Colby College and an MA in urban and environmental policy from Tufts University. And Sarah will give some context to this important issue today. Sarah, welcome. Thanks, Ellen, and thanks to EESI for uh, organizing this briefing. Um, so I thought I'd start with just trying to give a little context and um, definition of what we talk about when we talk about natural infrastructure or nature-based infrastructure. Um, I like to start off by saying, you know, when we talk about infrastructure, any type of infrastructure, we should be thinking of nature and all of nature's systems as a form of infrastructure. So when we're talking about making investments in infrastructure, uh, we are really trying to educate folks as to the opportunities and the services that investments in nature, the natural infrastructure, provide. Um, so that's kind of the, the big picture. Um, obviously, we're faced with uh, tremendous threats from increased climate impacts, and those threats are uh, in the form of increased 
flood events, increased extreme rain events, um, increased drought at the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, uh, increased wildfire. All of those increased threats, there is a role for um, conservation and restoration of nature as a form to reduce those threats. So I'm just going to walk through a couple um, examples of that. So we think about it in kind of the coastal context, in the riverine context, and also in the urban context. Um, so I'll start off in the urban. So in the urban context, um, you know, a, a large growing threat are increased rain events causing urban flooding, both from stormwater systems as well as just pooling and, and riverine kind of overflow from, from rivers and tributaries that run through um, urban areas. And certainly in that context, there's a lot of great work going on to make investments in green infrastructure. So in the urban context, we call it more green infrastructure. So things like greening um, uh, uh, bioswales, things along river, uh, along street systems that absorb water, um, also using things like permeable permeable pavement um, that absorb water instead of cause it to run off. Green roofs, um, increased planting of trees, all of those things can help abate um, both the, the flooding as well as provide other co-benefits. And that's the thing about making investments in nature. We don't see um, just uh, risk reduction from a primary threat like flooding, we see a suite of other benefits that come along with investment in nature. Um, so we see things like cooling of cities through increased um, tree canopy. We see um, increased absorption of carbon from um, increased trees in urban areas. Um, in the riverine context, we're really talking about um, I see the, <laughs> the congressman here, so I will pause for a second and uh, uh, yield the podium for a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Yes, thank you. I am um, delighted to welcome Congressman Charlie Crist, and we have been so uh, appreciative of all his efforts on, on this issue. Um, legislation reintroduced to uh, create a state revolving loan fund to help fund mitigation so that we can be better prepared um, is, is just one thing. Um, and we need these, these uh, innovative financing mechanisms. So, um, and, and I want to thank you also for sponsoring our briefing today and to Sarah Hansen for all her help. Uh, so I will welcome you here or wherever you want to be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ellen. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, thank all of you for being here. Anybody here from Florida? Excellent. Where? Nice. How about you? Venice. Pardon? Venice. Venice? Boca Raton. Boca Raton, not Boca Grande. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome, all of you, to the nation's capital. It's great to have you here, and this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is on the West Coast. And I represent St. Petersburg and Clearwater. And where I live is called Pinellas County. And Pinellas County is literally a peninsula. So uh, coastal resiliency is pretty darn important to me. Florida is also a peninsula. So these kinds of issues have been uh, rattling around my brain for a long time. And very important to my fellow Floridians, but very important to our planet, as you know. And so the existence of rising sea levels is something that I have seen with my own eyes in my home state. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be in Miami. There's a little debate down there later this week. And <clears throat> on Miami Beach, there's a place called Alton Road, where literally, when it's not raining, it floods. And I think it was President Obama who recognized this issue and said, when it's not raining and it's flooding, you've got to realize the sea is rising. And I think most people appreciate that. And it's really not a partisan issue, at least it shouldn't be. 
Um, look, I used to be a Republican. I am now a Democrat. And I feel like that uh, if you live near the coast anywhere, uh, you're probably pretty aware that this is happening and that this is real. And we need to pay attention to it and do everything that we possibly can to address it. And so that's why I'm privileged, Ellen, to be here in the United States Congress to help you and other organizations uh, that are involved do everything that we can to address this issue. Uh, because it's coming at us, it's coming at us fast, and it's increasing in its intensity. Um, and it's all related to climate change. And, you know, again, being a Floridian, we have these storms called hurricanes. And last year, Hurricane Michael was coming up the Gulf Coast in the Gulf Coast of Mexico, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and by the time it approached the Panhandle in Florida, it had become a Category 5 storm extremely quickly. Uh, and so that's another consequence of climate change and why we need to be as concerned as we are about coastal resilience as we are about the kind of storms that this thing creates. So I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for being focused on this important issue. Uh, it's probably the most important issue we have because if we don't have a planet, we don't have a future. And that's where this is. So God bless you. Thank you for being here. And uh, good luck to us all. Thank you so much, Congressman. We appreciate your efforts, and, and we need all the help we can get on these, these issues. Um, so Sarah, let me just invite you back up to the podium. So let me just finish up my, my broad definition of what we're talking about when we talk about natural infrastructure. So I, I talked about urban. Um, and then I was, I'm going to talk about riverine context briefly. So in the riverine context, um, we talk about natural infrastructure as, you know, mostly abating flood impacts. And, um, and in there, we're really talking about reconnecting river systems um, and, um, and uh, reconnecting both the floodplains to river systems and really allowing a more natural flow for riv rivers. Um, so that takes various forms um, in, uh, in river systems. It, we're talking about things like um, setting back levees and restoring the floodplains connected to, um, to rivers. We're talking about things like enlarging culvert sizes to allow for greater flow through those culverts and also allow for better fish, fish passage and better um, ecological connection of, of the river system, better sediment flow. Um, and we're talking about things like removing dams in some cases where the dams are no, ser no longer serving any sort of um, function and are relics. And um, by taking out those dams, we really are um, increasing the ecological health of the river and a lot of times reconnecting floodplains to, to those river systems. Um, and then finally, in the, in the coastal realm, um, there are, and we're going to hear probably uh, more examples of this from our speakers, um, there are so many things we can do to kind of increase the ecological health of our coastal systems that act as such an important buffer to increased threats that we're seeing from storms, from storm surge, from um, sea level rise. So everything from um, protecting uh, barrier beach areas, restoring those areas, um, increasing dune systems. Um, uh, Nature Conservancy is doing a lot of things like um, uh, restoring and building oyster reefs as a form for breaking wave energy and reducing storm threat. Um, in, the, in the Caribbean and in the um, southern part of Florida, we're doing coral restoration. Coral restoration, coral reefs are shown to um, uh, diminish wave energy by 95% when they're healthy. So, um, and we've done a lot of science work around that. Um, so there's more work to be done in terms of uh, measuring and monitoring the 
effectiveness of different ecological systems and their um, risk reduction value. We know a lot now, but we definitely have more work to be done in that, in that area. Um, and we also have more work and evidence to collect on the cost effectiveness. We know, again, um, some of the cost effectiveness, and we've measured some of that. Um, we did a, a study along the eastern seaboard post Sandy that valued the wetlands in place um, during that storm they abated $625 million in avoided damages to the structures and homes along that um, stretch where the kind of Virginia to Maine where that storm um, hit. So, um, so there's some good valuation, but there definitely needs to be more work done in that area as well. Um, and um, as I mentioned before with the urban systems, when you're making these investments in natural systems, um, you're not just abating one threat, but you're really bringing along a whole host of co-benefits, we call them. So water quality benefits, um, habitat, fishery habitat benefit, wildlife habitat benefit, recreational benefits, just community general aesthetic benefits. Um, so all of these things are, are co-benefits. Um, and natural infrastructure can also be thought of in conjunction with more traditional gray infrastructure as a way to green those systems as well and sometimes make them more sustainable and more resilient in the long run. Um, so that's a general frame I wanted to start off our discussion and I think you're going to hear some great place-based examples and I'm, if there's time um, I'm happy to chime in with a Gulf example as well later. So thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah, uh, for that good uh, context. And um, so, yes, uh, we are going to be looking at some place-based uh, examples. Um, on the uh, Gulf Coast, it's always helpful to sort of put these more abstract issues in, um, in something uh, specific. Um, but we also wanted to talk about how the federal uh, government is supporting these efforts in partnerships and um, uh, in, in, with resources. And so we were delighted to have Samantha Brook uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, Samantha is uh, the National Coastal and Marie, Marine Team Lead uh, in the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, she hails from Midcoast, Maine, uh, and has spent her career working at the state and federal level on coastal and marine conservation, um, on fisheries, uh, bycatch, marine mammal recovery, habitat restoration, and marine protected areas. So, Samantha, welcome. Thank you for that welcome, and thank you to all of our audience members for joining me here today uh, and for listening to a little bit about the Services Coastal Program. I'm sure I don't have to tell all of you, but our coastal and Great Lake communities are incredibly important. Coastal areas are home to 30% of the U.S. population and are valuable economic drivers. One way or another, we're all connected to the coast. I'm sure most of you have some personal connection as well. Uh, you heard that I grew up in coastal Maine, so very near and dear to my heart. Our coastal areas are also critical to the resources that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service cares about. I know most people are a little bit surprised when they hear U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working in the coastal environment, but in fact we have many different types of reasons to be there. Forty percent of the national wildlife refuges are located in coastal areas. We have 85 percent of migratory birds and waterfowl using that area. In addition, there are migratory bird flyways that contact at least um, one flyway contacting every coast, and 45 percent of the threatened and endangered species that we manage are in coastal habitats. The Coastal Program is a nationwide, voluntary, habitat restoration and protection program administered within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
will work around the country in coastal watersheds on public and private lands, providing technical and financial assistance to protect intact habitats and to restore degraded habitats, increasing long-term coastal resilience. The program has been around since the mid-1980s, and we've worked with over 6,000 partners from that time. We've restored over 1.5 million acres, and we've leveraged $1.6 billion for conservation. That's $8 for every $1 that we put into a project. Many of our projects restore natural systems to provide those critical services, such as wetlands for flood mitigation or mangroves to reduce the impact of waves, storm surge, and coastal erosion. These are the projects that uh, we had the excellent introduction from Sarah talking about, and they do differ from that traditional or gray infrastructure, also called hard infrastructure, that uses concrete or steel. Um, there is a lot of terms for them, as, as Sarah mentioned, green infrastructure, engineering with nature, uh, nature-based solutions, but regardless of, of what you call it, these types of projects are cost-effective, flexible, and they have direct on-the-ground benefits for our businesses and our communities. And again, here you can see uh, hi Sarah highlighted this um, study from the Hurricane Sandy, which demonstrated wetlands, provided uh, $625 million in direct property uh, damage protection. So I'm going to dive down to the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico, to coastal Texas, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one of those types of projects specifically that the coastal program is involved with. And I want to be clear that this is not a project that I've worked on directly. Uh, I'm very familiar with it, but there's a large group of partners here that are invested in this place, which include private landowners, state, federal, and county staff, uh, nonprofit organizations, and private landowners. So I'm going to just do my best to represent the amazing work that's going on there. The Salt Bayou is the largest contiguous tidal marsh in coastal in Texas. It's 90,000 acres. In the image you see here, the orange line represents the Salt uh, River, and then the blue is the watershed area that we're talking about, the restoration projects occurring in. This ecosystem has been significantly impacted by humans. Uh, you can see ship channels, oil and gas facilities, and road construction. And these projects have been going on for some time. Historically, resource managers were pulled into discussion with action agencies, and through those consultations, they began to realize that they lacked a shared vision for the future of the region, which meant that they weren't providing a coordinated set of options for restoration. This led to internal discussion about the overall goals for the salt bayou system. For example, there is excellent hunting and fishing in this area, as well as valuable commercial fisheries, and a lot of tourism and bird watching. And these different resource user groups were engaged in the conversation, but when you're restoring a place for bird habitat, your goals might be different than when you're restoring it for fish habitat. And so this was meaning that the folks weren't providing that nice consolidated set of opinions, even though they all agreed that saving the wetland was the most important thing. So it began a discussion about how they could work together and during that time, Hurricane Francis hit in about 1998, which resulted in significant fish kills and flooding. And that really spurred a recognition among the partners that there was a connection between these various projects and the need to take a higher level approach. So they really started to talk to one another about what was needed to make this system more resilient, began working on a higher level plan. There were still some folks who were a little bit uh, not sure yet. They weren't fully on board. And then came Hurricane Ike in 2008. And this hurricane was devastating for the region that we're talking about. Um, in fact, you can see in the uh, lower right-hand picture, this is the levee at Port Arthur. And you can see here it's uh, not quite overtopped. It did get even higher than that. And in fact, the floodgates weren't, com weren't able to even uh, fully close. And this was a game changer for the local community. I've just put some stats up here about the value of this area. It's a, incredibly important for the military, for oil and gas in the nation. It's a very important coastal waterway. So clearly, there was a lot of reasons that we all needed to be working together to protect these valuable infrastructure. And that really provided the motivation that was necessary to finalize the restoration plan for the, the region. In 2013, the Salt Bayou Watershed Restoration Plan was completed. 
That took 15 years. Nobody ever said that working on such a big thing would be easy, but uh, the group came together and the plan has four primary elephants, <laughs> elements, <laughs> some elephants in the room. Um, the beneficial use of dredged material to restore elevation to the eroding marsh in the state wetland management area, increasing freshwater inputs by installing siphons across the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, which would mimic those natural freshwater inflows. Um, there was also restoration of a historic beach ridge along the, the shore there to protect the marsh behind it, and finally improving the balance of salt water at the Keefe Lake Fish Pass. And I can report that there's a great deal of progress that has been made since that plan was finalized. Many, many partners came to the table to move the projects forward. And although work is ongoing, we're getting some really positive results um, where these projects have been completed or partially completed. In the uh, top right-hand corner, we have the beneficial use project. Now, working with industry on some state-managed uh, wetland areas, they completed one phase. And in fact, industry has come to the table again to put forward more uh, beneficial use projects. And that picture there shows the area directly after the project was completed. It's all green now. The salt marsh has come right back in, the vegetation. Uh, then in the top left-hand corner, we have the hydrological restoration. The modeling was done to take a look at what installing siphons in different areas would mean for the system. And that project is scheduled for construction to start in June. In the bottom right-hand corner, we've got the Beach Dune Ridge restoration. The project was completed in a pilot phase for three miles, and it was so successful um, that they were able to get the rest of the engineering and construction done, and they finalized it for the remaining 17 miles. That's expected to begin construction this fall or winter. And finally, the Keith Lake Fish Pass. That was completed in 2015, and in fact, data is demonstrating that it's working to better balance that influx of salt water into the system. So as I begin to wrap up, I really want to emphasize that none of these large-scale projects can be completed alone. And the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Coastal Program is just one of many, many partners at the table. And I've listed a few partners here. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the efforts of two partners in particular, um, Jim Sutherland with Texas Parks and Wildlife and Patrick Walther with the service. And both of them actually passed away recently, but were incredibly important, just key to moving these things forward. And you can see that they came from very, very different perspectives, and yet everybody at the table working together. If you'd like to learn more about this particular project, I'll draw your attention to a story on the Fish and Wildlife Service's Nature's Good Neighbor webpage. This is about uh, Judge, uh, Jefferson County Judge Brannick, and he was very valuable in helping ensure that the county permits and different um, regulations and everything could help move these projects forward. So I really encourage you to check out this great story. Um, I had a lot of fun visiting this area of the country and hearing from all the different partners. And lastly, uh, just a plug for our Fish and Wildlife Service Coastal Program webpage uh, and our Facebook page. So please feel free to check those out. And I'll be happy to share with you more about these various projects and projects in your areas if you're not from Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. As I said, uh, hopeful. I think it's so great to hear these examples, and um, that's just great news. So thank you so much. Um, next, uh, I am very happy to introduce, uh, I think, the person who traveled the furthest today, um, Rhonda Price um, from Mississippi. Rhonda is Deputy Director of Coastal Restoration and Community Resilience for the Mississippi Department of Marine Services. Um, and Rhonda's always, also um, the Coastal Resilience Team Lead for the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Um, in this role, she has helped to coordinate and enhance the efforts of state, local, federal business and uh, nonprofit partners uh, to assist coastal communities and ecosystems in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, region uh, to become more resilient in structure and function. So uh, the goals of the resilience team include increasing the Gulf region's understanding and localized risks associated with sea level rise, storm surge, subsidence, 
storm vulnerability and other threats. Um, also developing regional management tools to enhance resiliency through improved data, models, and methodologies, and implementing workshops to increase awareness and responsibility of individuals involved in emergency response at all levels. So Rhonda, thank you so much for being here. I know it, it was not an easy thing to, uh, to find your way here, but we appreciate your persistence. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Yes, it was um, a little bit of um, uh, an adventure getting here, but, but I'm here. And thank you for that lovely introduction and for approaching the Gulf of Mexico Alliance Resilience Team to come talk about uh, resilience. Uh, it's something that is near and dear to my heart, and I guess that's why I lead the resilience team is because it took a lot of resilience to get here today. Um, let's see. So I'm going to start off with uh, maybe some of you may or may not be familiar with the Gulf Mexico Alliance. Um, it is a regional partnership that was started in 2004 by the governor of Florida, Jeb Bush. And he was looking for, um, I guess, partners from other governors and other states along the coast that were working on some of the same maybe issues of concern that they wanted to address dealing with ecological and economic health. Uh, at the time, they really didn't have anything to focus on until 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf. And there um, really gave the um, the essence of, of an alliance. The thought was there that a regional partnership was needed um, and it really, I guess timing is everything. So the alliance was there and when the need um, was, um, you know, was, was, you know, needed, um, that was when the structure of the alliance took shape. So it is state-led, and there are state representatives that appointed by the governor that make up for the alliance management team. Um, there is a headquarters with an executive director, and Laura Bowie is a force to be reckoned with, if you do not know her. Um, Laura has really done an excellent job in keeping our teams focused and, and going in the right direction. Uh, there are six priority teams right now. We have a thousand active members. We have a business advisory council with uh, seven large industries in the Gulf. And right now we have 150 uh, federal um, people that make up our federal advisory group. And uh, we have a little over 3,000 people on our, our GOMA email list. So some of the roles that the Alliance plays, um, of course, it is a partnership. So we believe in providing collaboration for those regional priority issues, uh, developing tools and pilot projects for regional use, and then strategic partnerships that allow partner networking. Uh, how do we do it? Well, after 2005, uh, there was an action plan that was created in 2006. We are now in our action plan number three. So each of the teams will have various focus areas that they want to identify and then actions that will take place underneath those focus areas, which are their, our goals. Uh, as I mentioned, there are six priorities and we are the Coastal Resilience Team. Um, we do, however, pull from the other teams if um, we need any other information like restoration or habitat, um, and education is also a great team as well. We have our GovStar partnership, and that is a funding source that allows projects to be funded through GOMA, and uh, it is used for fulfillment of our action plan that allows the teams to get on the ground and really um, solve some of the actions and priorities that they have within the plan. As you can see, it's made up of state, federal, and, and uh, lots of, of private funding as well. So by the numbers, uh, so far we've had 2.3 million in project funding and 100% goes to those projects. Uh, 45 projects and 131 institutions are participating. 
So I am here to talk about uh, resilience and part of the resilience team is um, what are we about. So we try to look at regional um, response and allow or and assisting communities uh, and states to become more uh, resilient and respond better to natural and man-made hazards. And the way that we do that is through our assessments, uh, communication, and planning and adaptation. So those are our three focus areas that allow us to focus on our goals and connecting those Gulf states. Um, we work to increase awareness and knowledge of our tools and resources, uh, promote understanding of those resources, and then the adaptation, mitigation, and restoration strategies that help preserve our, our heritage along with our natural resources. Some of the uh, accomplishments that the team uh, has um, completed and is still ongoing over the last couple of years has been our Resilience Index. And that was a project by the Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana Sea Grant, the self-assessment that allows local decision makers to go through uh, six sections of looking at their tr uh, critical infrastructure, transportation, business plans, and evaluating um, risk, whether they are weak or, or um, they hadn't even thought about it. So it allows the opportunity to sit down and have that conversation with those local municipalities and even highlight in certain sections where the community rating system points could be identified and used later on. Um, as a result of the success of that, we have created three more indices for tourism, fisheries, and the port. Uh, one of the small grant programs that have come out of the Gulf Star was working with Aransas Pass. They did the resilience index and realized that they uh, had a weakness and wanted to develop a long-term plan to address coastal resilience. They conducted a community-wide outreach campaign and um, right now they are, they are working on implementing that, that plan. Um, we also work in a lot of green infrastructure approaches as well, not just large landscape, but also in the communities. Uh, some of that is working with our homeowners. So being part of the Department of Marine Resources, we have a permitting office, and when homeowners are coming in looking at alternatives to hard structures like bulkheads, we really didn't have an answer for them, and a lot of other states didn't either come to find out. So um, with a partnership with Sea Grant and Mississippi State University Extension, they created a permitting guide. And through the permitting guide allows homeowners to kind of do a checklist. Is this um, living shoreline going to work for, for me? And if so, what are the cost benefits and the permitting requirements that I have to go through in order to, um, to install uh, a living shoreline? So there are several workshops and trainings that we have with, with homeowners and another, um, through funding source that we received through the Resilience Community of Practice created a green infrastructure working group. So they decided to go one step further and create five resource catalog catalogs for each state. And those look at design and construction, some case studies, some pictures of before and after, and then just some fun facts about each of the states and the economic value uh, that living shorelines could provide. So if you're looking for any more information, um, there's gulflivingshorelines.com. It is um, a, a wonderful resource guide, not only for the homeowner, it also targets realtors, uh, contractors and developers, and land use planners. So it, uh, it includes everyone that is going to be vital in making decisions on constructing living shorelines. And as you can see, once again, there's a lot of partners and collaboration that goes into uh, creating those resource guides. So another uh, funding source that I just happened to be fortunate enough to work on was EPA uh, connecting the dots. And that provided technical assistance to cities who 
in turn took the resilience index and, and identified some weaknesses. So part of uh, this grant for connecting the dots was looking at uh, community specific vulnerabilities and how to measure and mitigate those hazards and then creating that community dialogue that's really important is um, communicating that information back to the community. So the one that I'm going to focus on now is or talk about is the Living Shoreline Project in Biloxi, Mississippi. So a lot of cities are looking at alternative ways and um, wanting to um, um, kind of um, Shorten, harden shorelines naturally and combat a lot of coastal erosion. So they are looking to a more natural alter alternative and that is the living shorelines. So we had three demonstration projects that were going up um, which in turn allowed the homeowners the, uh, the opportunity to go in and see some of these demonstration projects. So it really wasn't planned, it just kind of happened that way that um, we were working with the permitters in creating training and workshops on how to get your permit. But then there was where can these homeowners see live living shorelines and then learn about the application. So through connecting the dots, um, Stephen Deal, who is with the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant, worked with the city of Biloxi in creating some of these kiosks that are going around to the three sites. And it not only lets you look at the living shoreline and the function, it gives you a little information about it as well. What is a living shoreline? What is the cost benefit? And, and what are you looking at? And you can see at the bottom, there's once again, lots of partners. We had our Secretary of State, um, the Nature Conservancy was involved, and this was the installation of the living shoreline at the Old Brick House. And it was used there to provide um, uh, reduced wave energy to uh, lessen the effects of erosion on shore. Another project that was a um, community grant was through the uh, to the city of Ocean Springs and they wanted to install rain gardens so it brought community involvement together that everyone got out learned about rain gardens and uh, the effects of it another one was the harbor infrastructure adaptation plan so they had a coastal erosion problem around their harbor and so they turned to a living shoreline um, application to reduce that uh, coastal erosion. Uh, another project that I fell in love with, um, Nicholas Satterfield with the um, uh, New Orleans Redevelopment Authority spoke at our uh, resilience team meeting in Austin in December. The resilience team has a, a meeting once a year outside of our yearly all hands meeting and he talked about the community adaptation program which uh, was a, um, a grant that was received to provide residents with residential storm water management to improve their 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 homes um, and it was in the Gentilly Resilience District and I love the idea of a resilience district so we have historical districts we have business districts and now we have a resilience district um, and I think that's that's fabulous even in um, um, Alabama there is a whole fortified community so I could see that being a, a resilience district as well but through the community adaptation program they put together um, just identifying different things that homeowners could do. They could install rain gardens, detention basins, plant trees, and stormwater planter box, and then it gives you the level of labor, um, your rain capacity, and how much it's going to cost. So I think um, uh, I'm going to go back one because I want to make a point. And so we were looking at the homeowner, and I think providing those community grants to homeowners to allow them the control and once you've given them the tools uh, to allow them to um, 
kind of make their property more sustainable. And in doing so, the municipality becomes more sustainable. And once the municipality is more sustainable, then the state becomes more resilient. So it's kind of a, a pyramid effect. And having these community grants and the ability to reach and provide those, those funding opportunities to homeowners and to those local municipalities really make a huge difference in, in creating uh, more resilient states. Um, and so another uh, approach to shoreline that, that we look at is the more natural, larger landscape um, living shorelines, whether that be dunes, beaches, salt marshes, oysters, or, or coral reefs that, that um, break those, the waves and the wave energies. Um, one of the projects that were in Mississippi, so through the Gulf Regional Sediment Master Plan uh, that was created through the GOMA's Habitat Team, Mississippi created the Master Plan for Beneficial Use of Dredge Material for Coastal Mississippi, and that plan was used um, to provide um, the restoration of Round Island, which is a now uh, back to a, almost a historical footprint of a 200-acre island. And it not only provides uh, wonderful habitat, it also provides some sort of storm surge protection just off the coast of, of what is Pascagoula. Another shoreline approach that we've been working on is the Hancock County Marsh Living Shoreline, and that is a hybrid approach where we're putting oyster uh, reef balls and um, out in front of the marsh to uh, combat coastal erosion. So that is our hybrid of tent is about six, almost six miles and uh, 46 acres of marsh. So part of, of all of this is our um, Campaign Awareness for 2020, and that is Embracing the Gulf. So we are wanting to um, hold a gala in June to coincide with our all hands, and we are expecting um, some of our keynotes to be those founding fathers of the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, and that's Haley Barber, Jeb Bush, and Rick Perry. So if you're in Biloxi or want to have an excuse to come to Biloxi and the Beau Rivage, please join us for the gala. Um, Becky Ginn is the project coordinator of that, and she is a rock star. Um, and last but not least, we are working on authorization for our Regional Ocean and Coastal Coordination Act, which would designate RFPs um, and NOAA as coordinators for federal and state authorities. Um, we're looking to introduce that into the Senate this month, and we're looking for sponsors in the House right now. Um, we have all five gov um, governor's offices that have signed on, and we feel that the purpose of regional ocean partnerships, if you kind of haven't figured that out already, uh, partnerships get a lot of work done. And it enables us to receive that funding directly and get it down to the communities quickly. And so with that, um, I will wrap up. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Rhonda. And I am delighted to introduce our final speaker on the panel. Derek Brockbank is Executive Director of the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association. Uh, Derek is responsible for the growth, uh, strategic planning, government affairs goals of uh, this organization, which is the nation's leading organization advocating for beach and coastal restoration. Derek has a background in climate and coastal conservation and experience as a grassroots organizer. Um, and he is getting ASBPA to lead coastal communities and decision makers in the tough but necessary conversations about how they'll address sea level rise, increasing storm intensity, and other climate impacts. So we're really happy to have Derek with us today. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be uh, batting cleanup, I guess, on this uh, esteemed panel. So thank you to my previous panelists and the ESI for inviting me. Um, my presentation today is going to really be sort of two s parts together. The first part is going to be talking about uh, a more systemic issue and systemic solutions to nature-based resilience, particularly for shoreline and coastline management. So it's going to be looking at regional sediment management and beneficial use of dredge material. And then I'm going to pivot to what Congress can do about many of the things that we've heard here. So some of that will be about RSM and, and beneficial use, but some of that will also just be general things that Congress can be working on. So hopefully you can take that back to your offices, some of your bosses, and, and share, that, share those words. Um, so first off, ASBPA, we are uh, an organization of coastal and beach practitioners. So we are the communities, the industry, uh, and the academics that build, maintain, and manage our nation's beaches. So we include, you know, towns like Orange Beach, Alabama, and Galveston, Texas. So both big towns, small towns, as well as industry ranging from the big dredging companies to small little private environmental consultants. Um, and we believe in the, uh, we advocate for the restoration of beaches and coastlines for four interconnected values. I think you've probably heard them amongst the panel, but we define them as the protection benefit they provide, uh, the ecological benefit they can provide, the recreation, and obviously when you think about beaches, you think about recreation, but there, there are these other benefits, and then um, the economic value they provide to coastal communities. Very interconnected, but all very important to why we need to maintain healthy coastal systems. Okay, let's dig in. Uh, sediment. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about dirt. We're talking about sand. We're talking about silts and clays, dirt and mud. And it really is the building block of a natural coastal system. So this is a shoreline in uh, Galveston, Texas, that, as you can see, is in badly in need of erosion. It's, it's those, those properties are threatened by the next storm that comes along the Gulf of Mexico. So you could have put up a seawall, um, but we believe it's a better solution to actually rebuild that beach and dune system. That both provides a, a layer of protection that uh, uh, just as good as a seawall could provide, but it also provides habitat. This is sea turtle habitat area, so you can have nesting sea turtles on that. Obviously, if you're a, a, home, a beach owner or a, a beach home owner or a hotel there, you'd rather have a beach in front of your house than a seawall, so there's a lot of benefits that it can provide, but really that takes sediment, and um, we are facing a sediment, crisis, a sediment shortage crisis on our shoreline. Sediment is just not readily available. Um, this is a picture of, from the air from Louisiana. It's not just beaches that are eroding, it's our wetlands too. Obviously, if you've been to Louisiana, you know it's facing the greatest land loss in the country, one of the highest levels of land loss in the, in the, uh, in the world. Um, this used to be uh, contiguous marsh, and now it's open water because that sediment, well, there's many reasons we can get into, but, um, but a big part of that is it's eroding, and the rebuilding part of that is not happening because there's just not enough sediment getting to coastal Louisiana. So where is all the sediment gone? Why is this a crisis? Well, a couple things. Um, over the past hundred years, we've channelized our, our rivers and bayous and, and tributaries. So um, we've both hardened the shoreline, so the eroding banks of a river, which is the sediment that would eventually end up on our coast, the river banks are no longer eroding. We've got them concrete and cemented in, so you're not getting that sediment into the system. We've also channelized it. Bayous don't naturally run that straight. They meander, they, they weave. That creates a much slower system, which allows sediment to accumulate in them. If you channelize them, if you have them straight, they move fast and they carry a lot of sediment out deep into offshore. Um, someone mentioned, uh, I think Sarah mentioned dam removal. We often think about dam removal for fish, but there's a ton, literally, literally tons and tons of sediment trapped behind dams. And that sediment is never going to get to the coast. So if you're coastal Louisiana and you want to see sediment rebuilding your marshes, that sediment is trapped up in, in Arkansas and, 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 you know, Minnesota and all the way up into the Dakotas even. So you've got sediment behind, uh, behind dams. And then, of course, we've, uh, we've, to support navigation, we've put jetties out to make sure that, that we can flush out that sediment from the coastal system to go offshore to maintain navigation purposes. But that also means the sediment that would naturally be accumulating in shoals in uh, waterways is not moving on to the beach in a high flood tide. It's actually being pushed offshore. Um, one more uh, is issue here, not for the Gulf Coast, but in a cliff area, uh, cliff-faced beaches such as out in California, some areas in the um, Great Lakes, uh, we've hardened cliffs. You build a home at the top of the cliff, you don't want your home to fall off the cliff, you harden that cliff. That eroding cliff is actually what uh, builds the beaches in California, so they're, they're seeing tremendous beach, uh, beach loss in California because that natural sediment is no longer, is no longer there. Um, so, uh, and then even once the sediment is available, um, we're not using it beneficially. We're not putting it to good, to good use. So obviously Louisiana 
uh, you see we've pushed that, the bird's foot delta is really pretty much to the edge of the outer continental shelf, so all that sediment that's being sh pushed out of the Mississippi is being wasted off the continental shelf, even in high flood tides when they open the Bonnie Carey spillway, the sediment goes into Lake Pondertrain, which is a fairly deep lake, it's not actually building in the sediment area, so we're not using sediment properly. So, what's the solution? Well, we need to beneficially, we need to manage our sediment regionally, and we need to beneficially use our dredge material. Um, Dr. Houston, who is the former director of Army Corps' ERDIC, the Engineering and Research Development Center in Vicksburg, has said uh, shoreline recession is not natural, but caused by human activity to benefit the navigation industry. Obviously, there's some caveats to that. Some of it is natural, but it has certainly been exacerbated by navigation. I would also add to that, um, I think our, our system of flood protection, uh, you know, building up levee structures, hardening our shorelines, has also exacerbated this too. But the point being, you know, we've managed our river systems, we've managed our inlets, we've hardened our inlets, we're trying to get sediment out of that river and inlet system, and that means it's not going to the coast. So, um, this would be a pro so this is causing that sediment uh, crisis on the coast. Um, this would be a problem no matter what was happening, but it's in the midst of exacerbating factors. Louisiana, um, or heck, even right nearby in Hamptons Roads, Virginia Beach area, uh, we're seeing great levels of subsidence where the land is actually sinking. So if you've got an eroding coastline and you've got sinking land, it's bad news if you're trying not to get wet. Um, hardening uh, shorelines. Uh, you put up a bulkhead and totally get it. You're a property owner. You, you buy a beach, your waterfront home, and all of a sudden you see your, your, the, edge of your, uh, the edge of your property going into the shore. You want to put up a bulkhead, protect it. Well, that's great, but that actually exacerbates the um, land loss in front of it, even in a, uh, a low energy system like, uh, like here in, in Alabama. I think this is Gulfport Bay. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's going to exacerbate that, that loss of sand in front of it. And then, of course, the big one, which we heard about, we heard about from Congressman Christ, sea level rise. Um, so all the things I'm going to talk about today in terms of beneficial reuse and in fact most of the policy things that I'm going to talk about, all things that should be happening irregardless of climate change. But climate change, subsidence, hardening of shorelines, all of these things make it that much more important. These are efforts that need to be done, but you sort of, you know, you're putting all these, uh, climate change is sort of the steroids of the coastal crisis. Okay, so what's already happening? I'm going to run through this pretty quick. There's a lot happening. We've heard about it already. We talk, uh, uh, Samantha talked about the beneficial use project at Saltwater Bayou. That's how they're restoring that area. Um, Rhonda mentioned, I think, a couple different beneficial use projects that they're working on through GOMA, and certainly GOMA has been the, the driving force of regional sediment management in the region. Um, but a couple things that I just wanted to sort of flag. Louisiana has a state coastal master plan. It's a comprehensive $50 billion, 50-year plan. Part of that plan is a sediment management plan. How do we actually use the sediment that is in Louisiana, whether that's you know, just offshore, whether that's in the wetlands, or whether that's coming out of the Mississippi River? How can we actually put it to good use? They're also proposing sediment diversions, which would be a sort of natural way of taking, or a, a mimic a natural way of taking sediment out of the river and putting it into the wetlands. So you don't actually have to have mechanical dredges moving this sediment. You just take, uh, open up essentially a floodgate, a controlled floodgate, um, during times of high sediment, high water flow, and that'll pump sediment right out into the wetlands where it's, where it's needed as opposed to, you know, Lake Pond Train or off the Outer Continental Shelf. Um, marsh creation projects, this is very specifically uh, what's happening in Saltwater Bayou, what's happening in, in um, uh, well, I guess in, in the Mississippi project, the one you mentioned there, it's actually building a barrier island, but you can just pump uh, sediment. In Louisiana, they are pumping sediment over 20 miles from the Mississippi River into marsh creation areas where it's needed. So you can, the, the technology is there to move sediment a long, long way at affordable prices if, if the situation is dire enough. So um, the other area which I don't think has happened that much in the Gulf, but is starting to happen, this is actually, I think, a Nature Conservancy project in New Jersey, is what they call thin layer placement. So rather than pumping in sediment to build up a brand new marsh or turn open water into marsh, you're taking a potentially relatively healthy marsh and spreading out about a couple inches of sediment that's being dredged, that needs to be dredged anyway, but rather than just sort of dumping it off the side of the dredge, you, you spray it out over the project, and that helps accrete, that helps build the project up. So if you do this, you know, every couple years and, and put in two to three to five to eight inches of sediment, you can actually keep, help marshes keep up with sea level rise doing it that way. Um, 
And then finally, the one that you know, we obviously think most about as a beach organization is taking dredging from an inlet, from a navigation channel, and placing it on a beach. This is uh, Babe's Beach. It's, a, it's a, a beach in Galveston, Texas, that won uh, ASBPA's Best Restored Beach Award a couple years ago. Uh, and actually, just this week, or maybe it was last week, um, Galveston, Project, Galveston District of the Corps announced they were going to be doing a new dredging cycle for the Galveston Ship Channel, and Babe's Beach was going to be the recipient of that dredge, pro of that dredge material. So it's going to continue to re-nourish. Um, that restored beach. So rather than just having a Galveston seawall, you actually have a beach in front of Galveston seawall. So again, it's an economic generator. There's starting to be some uh, wildlife habitat based on it. And then, um, uh, and then of course, you know, a, a beach is a much more, much nicer recreation opportunity than a seawall. So you got some good things happening already. Um, we can go into this more in questions. I, I, I outlined a couple things that the state, each of the five Gulf states are doing. Uh, in terms of regional sediment management, beneficial use. Again, a, a big shout out to the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Their um, conservation habitat team has really pulled together the Gulf of Mexico regional sediment management plan. And that, I in my opinion, has really driven a lot of the work that's going on in some of these other states. Um, another big piece of, of regional sediment management is the core. The core is the manager of our nation's water, uh, our, our coastal systems and, and water ways uh, and is the one responsible for moving a lot of this dredge material. And um, here's where I think the Gulf is, is actually pretty lucky. In my opinion, I think three of the best core districts on regional sediment management are in the Gulf. Uh, Jacksonville, Mobile, and Galveston are all doing really good work. They're sort of thinking beyond the, the silos that is often set up from the core. If you're either in navigation or you're a coastal or you're a flood risk reduction, they're really looking at how they can blend budget lines, how they can think about project timing so that, you know, if, if this beach needs some sediment, maybe we can time the, the dredging of the immediate adjacent channel to correspond with when we can actually place the sand on that beach. So you're, you're, you need to sort of think a little bit outside the box, and they're doing some good, uh, good work there. Uh, I mentioned Erdic. There's actually a regional sediment management program based out of Erdic. Erdic is in Vicksburg, Mississippi. It does service the nation, but I think just the proximity to Vicksburg has helped some of these core districts be leading thinkers on RSM. Um, there's also a number of studies going on uh, right now in regional sediment management or that have regional sediment management as a major component to it. In the Gulf, that's uh, the South Atlantic Coast Study, which is actually references the South Atlantic Division of the Corps, so as well as the South Atlantic Coast. It's also looking at the Gulf Coast of Florida as well as Alabama and Mississippi. And then there's the Texas Coastal Area Study, which is looking at how to manage sediment at a regional level in Texas. And then I already mentioned the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan, which is run by the state, not the Corps. But it, you really have a good comprehensive coastal studies going on throughout the coast. Um, engineering with Nature, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but the Corps put out a, an atlas of uh, projects across the nation, uh, actually across the world. There's some uh, U.S. as well as internationally that talk about how you can how you can do essentially nature-based resilience, looking at both um, natural solutions as well as uh, as well as net, uh, resilient solutions. Um, and then the Section 1122 Beneficial Use of Dredge Material Pilot Program, program authorized um, in the last word. Okay, I've spent way too much time talking on this. Now I need to talk about what you can do. Um, so this is going to be far quicker than it probably should be. Uh, but here are a couple things. Uh, I'm going to list off four different areas that can be supported. And for each one, I'm going to throw out two specific ways in which you can be helpful. So uh, four times two, that's eight different ideas. There are probably dozens of things that you can be doing, but these are just a couple. Um, first off, Army Corps. They said they manage, they manage the coast. Um, two things that I think they could be doing better and Congress can help in terms of oversight. One, change the, federal stand, change the understanding of the federal standard. So the federal standard says a core must dispose of dredge material as cheaply as possible so long as it's environmentally, it's not violating any environmental, um, it's not causing any environmental problems. Which means it's often cheapest to dump dredge material offshore rather than beneficially use it. And that might be true in the short term, but I believe if you sort of think more big picture about what those costs are, the overall lifetime cost is going to be greater if you're dumping sediment offshore and then later on that beach or that coastal system then has to figure out a new place to get dredge material. So I think, I don't necessarily think you need to get rid of the federal standard, but I think we need to change the federal standard or change the understanding to incorporate the full lifetime cost of both the, the, the dredge project as well as the immediately adjacent um, potential restoration projects. Secondly, uh, I think we need to reform the benefit cost ratio uh, process that the core uses. Right now, the core is um, 
uh, authorizes project based on a sort of essentially a single variable. So if you are a flood risk management project, all the benefits calculated are flood risk management benefits. If you're a, if you're a, a navigation project, it's based on navigation benefits, um, which means projects that have multiple benefits, projects that, you know, maybe flood risk management, but also have pretty significant ancillary wildlife or habitat or ecological values, those benefits aren't being calculated. And so you've got a, you know, you've got a levy that's going up in competition with a wetland, and maybe the levy provides better flood protection marginally, but the wetland is going to have tremendous other values in terms of ecological value, recreation value. So we need to think about the benefits more broadly. There was effort in Laos Warda to address this. It ended up getting pushed to a National Academy study. I think we actually need to see the Corps reform this process. Um, okay, legislation. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, there's uh, Water Resources Development Act legislation that has a lot of stuff going in it. Um, but two specific ones that I wanted to call out that are, are really good and are introduced in the House right now, the Living Shorelines Act, this would fund, um, this would authorize a fund uh, to be administered by NOAA that would support living shorelines projects, so it's essentially a grant program to fund living shorelines. Congressman Pallone introduced it, gosh, about a month ago, I think, um, but uh, HR 3115, reach out to Pallone's office if you're interested. Um, second is the Coastal Communities Adaptation Act, this was introduced by Representative Harley Rauda, who's out of California, um, but it was actually a little bit of the brainchild of Senator Nelson um, before he left office, uh, and this would create essentially a, a sort of new revolving fund for uh, communities to do coastal adaptation, natural, sort of naturally based coastal adaptation projects. Um, so it would be very little cost to the federal government, but it would allow communities to have access to low interest or no interest loans. Um, two very good things, uh, very good bills. Uh, you know, if you're interested, reach out to the members to co-sponsor or learn more or, you know, just look them up on Thomas. Um, finally, or not finally, uh, probably most importantly, the sustained federal investment. Um, obviously, all these things that we've, all of us have been talking about take money. Local communities can support some of it, but the federal government needs to kick in. And this means passing appropriations bills on time. Um, the three ones that I think are probably most relevant here are energy and water, uh, commerce, justice, and science, and interior and environment. That covers Army Corps, covers NOAA, covers the suite of interior uh, uh, agencies, including Samantha's agency. <clears throat> Fund them on time. If they're not funded on time, they spend a whole lot of money trying to figure out how to spend less money than what they have. So it's, it's just a real waste to see these appropriations bills get delayed. Um, and then we also need to fund coastal programs. I could take up 10 slides to fund all the, to show you all the good programs that, are, that should be funded, um, but th they're critical. The second related piece to this is we need to fund resilience before a storm. So much of the funding that we are getting right now from resilience comes post-storm. We've had the hurricane uh, disaster supplementals, Great to see the Congress step up and, and fund resilience, but that should be done before the storm, not after the storm. However, I will say, until there is that political impetus to start funding these before the storm, the post-storm disaster recovery money is absolutely essential. Um, that's how the Corps is doing much of their work. That's how Fish and, we were just talking before the, uh, the panel about how Fish and Wildlife Service has, what was it, $50 million or $40 million to do resilience work on its land, and that's money that wouldn't have come from, wouldn't have been available except for uh, post-disaster recovery. And then finally, <coughs> uh, the big thing is how do these all work together? Natural-based natural resilience doesn't happen in a vacuum. We need to be supportive of all the other adjoining pieces of society, really. Um, and I think that starts with infrastructure. Congress has continued to talk about, the administration has continued to talk about a major infrastructure package. Um, our, nature, our, our, our nation's coastlines are as much critical infrastructure as anything else, whether it's broadband, air, airports, shipping ports, roads, our nation's beaches, dunes, and wetlands are critical natural infrastructure that are providing the protection and the resilience to the rest of the nation's infrastructure. It's sort of the, the homeowner's policy. You're not going to go out and spend, get a new home if you, don't, if you don't get that protection. So you need to invest in, in natural infrastructure. And I think it's also really important that natural or nature-based infrastructure is called out specifically in any infrastructure le legislation. We're not talking about just seawalls and, and levee systems. We're talking about beaches, dunes, and wetlands and things like that. 
And then sort of finally after that, you need to, we also need to think about how we're supporting the communities because if we're not supporting the communities, there's not going to be the public need for this, these healthy coastlines. So whether that's supporting the industries like shipping, supporting ports, you know, full use of harbor maintenance trust funds, supporting the fishing industry, we need to be make sure that we're, su we're supporting, uh, Congress is supporting the, the communities that rely on these coastal systems because um, it really is, you know, it's all integrated. If, if you let the shipping industry fall apart, the, the economy of certain towns could collapse and then, and then you don't have that, uh, that drive for coastal restoration. So with that, I will wrap up. I went really quickly there, but I think we're happy to take, happy to take questions. Derek, thank you so much. That was uh, a, a wonderful to uh, hear some of those uh, legislative solutions that, uh, that we might be able to take. Um, and I might even add um, CBO uh, scoring might be an issue to look at in terms of uh, uh, being able to account for these long-term um, benefits. So, um, yeah, uh, in investing in mitigation is, is really essential. Um, so I'd like to open it up to your questions. We have 15 minutes. Anyone? A shy group. Oh, yes, sir. You were talking about how a lot of the sediment is getting pushed farther out seas because of these channels. Um, I was wondering, is there a way to get that sediment back by dredging, or is it pushed too far? And if we, and if we can't, is it uh, dangerous to keep taking sediment from inland? Will that soon be pushed away as well? This on? Yes, great. Um, great question. Uh, so yes, the, the sediment that it gets dumped offshore, it, it, de it depends is the short answer. So um, if it's getting pushed out past the outer, outer continental shelf, so the bird's foot delta of the, of the Mississippi River, you know, as you can sort of see on that map, extends way far out past the rest of Louisiana. And it's really close to that outer continental shelf where there's a big drop off. So all of a sudden you're looking at you know, 600 foot deep water to 6,000 foot deep water. And once it goes off that outer continental shelf, it's essentially economically, I mean, you can't get to it. It's, it's just too deep. Um, when it gets pushed offshore to the 600-foot water, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where some of the sort of mixed signals are getting. So if, you, if you're dredging and dumping it offshore, you know, two years later, they're literally going back and taking it from where you dumped it and putting it back on shore. So you've got, you know, you've got an increased price, but because you've mistimed it, it's, um, it's not happening. And then um, your question to whether uh, taking allowing sediment from inshore, are you referring to sort of having it come down from rivers, like getting rid of removing dams kind of thing? Um, I mean, there is always danger, you know, sedimentation creates turbidity, which is, you know, sediment in the water, uh, and that can have impacts on certain sensitive ecosystems. So coral reefs, you don't want a big, you know, sediment-rich uh, flow going into a coral reef system because that could kill the coral. But in most... I think for the Gulf Coast, and most of the Gulf Coast systems, you're not looking at that kind of sensitive. You're looking at marshes, subaqueous vegetation, which can usually handle uh, sediment flow into that area. Um, I don't know, you might want to talk. There, there can be some issues with freshwater flow into oyster reefs, but, you know, historically there were oyster reefs all over the Gulf Coast, so, you know, they might shift a little bit in, in placement, but uh, you're still going to have plenty of oysters on the Gulf Coast. Anything to add to that? Yeah, thank you for that question. Is there one back there? Can you discuss both benefits and possible disadvantages to dredging? Every session, it seems, in the Maryland General Assembly, there are bills to permit dredging. And it's very difficult to determine whether it's a beneficial option. How, how can we determine whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to do in the Bay? I guess some of it depends on what your, your values are. I mean, you know, so if you're, if, what, and what the purpose of the dredging is, I think, one of the things that I was trying to make the case is where there is dredging, 
that's when it needs to be used beneficially. So, um, you know, we're a, we're a beach organization and work on conservation, so I, I don't have a position on whether something should be dredged for navigation or not. Maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't. That's, you know, not something I work on. But if you're going to dredge for navigation, if you want to keep a, a channel or an inlet open so that ships can get in and out, and I'm not going to take a position on whether you should or not, but if you're doing that, then you might as well make use of that sediment that is being picked up from the bottom of an inlet or the bottom of a riverbed, riverbed and, and put it to a place that needs it, like an eroding marsh or a, a, an eroding beach. Do you have a follow-up? It was one of the first slides that we looked at, and it was very troubling to me in the sense that there were structures, houses, it appeared, on a, a downhill slope very close to the beach. Is that a good idea? And that it, it seems that if we were to determine whether we should do that today, assuming it's empty, should we be putting, you know, structures so close to the beach and then on a downhill slope? Thank you. Yeah, I think you raise a really good point that um, communities are becoming more and more aware of vulnerability and by doing things like vulnerability assessments, hoping we're hoping the uh, awareness is raised more of avoiding areas that we should further develop. Um, and even there is more and more conversation about retreating from areas that we are, have already developed. So it's becoming obvious that, you know, there's a lot of existing building and infrastructure and property that's going to uh, be destroyed because of increasing um, coastal storms and impacts. Um, so it's... I don't see, uh, you know, a, a near-term flip of people, you know, suddenly not wanting to, to develop a, along the coast or in other risky areas. Um, but I think uh, we need to keep raising awareness about those increased risks. Does anybody else have anything? I'll just add one thing. In the, con in the congressional solutions that we talked about and the sort of integration of, you know, people and infrastructure and, and is I think there needs, to be, there needs to be additional funding so that communities that are repeatedly hit by flooding or repeatedly, um, you know, in harm's way, there's funding to buy out those houses. There are folks out there that don't want to, st I mean, you know, you hear all those stories of like, oh, they've been flooded 30 times and they're rebuilding. Well, you know what? Chances are they probably don't want to rebuild, but it's really challenging to get a buyout. Even if there's money available, it's challenging. And if there's no money available, then you're basically asking people to throw away their life savings and their home to, to move. So I think that's another thing Congress can do is, is make that funding available and also work with the various federal agencies to make it easier um, particularly for, for, you know, low income, often less educated uh, communities, often communities that have, particularly in Louisiana, there's a strong Vietnamese population where language issues are really challenging, um, you know, to make it easier for communities to understand what their options are to no longer reside in, in flood risk areas. And to that point, I'm glad that you mentioned that because uh, the House, um, House Financial Services Committee did report out um, a, a national flood insurance program reform and reauthorization bill, and now um, looking for the Senate to take action, obviously for it to come to the floor in the House. But that's um, that's a, a both an insurance program and a, a risk management program, risk mitigation. So um, I think that's something to also keep in mind, David. I, I may have missed it, but I don't think any speaker mentioned FEMA. And my question will be, there's talk about significant increase in pre-disaster mitigation funding from FEMA. Uh, do you see any of that funding somehow flowing into nature-based resilience? Thanks for that great question. Um, so FEMA is now... Um, uh, FEMA is a very important agency in this context because a lot of funding, Derek mentioned, post-disaster, most of that's coming from FEMA. Um, they have a lot of money that they invest in 
risk reduction mitigation through post-disaster and also through programs like um, the flood insurance program. So right now they have, um, they, last year there were, Congress reformed the Stafford Act and the pre-disaster mitigation program, creating this new program that's going to greatly increase the amount of funding available for pre-disaster mitigation, which is great. Um, so we're going to see a three, four fold going from about 200 million to maybe even 800 to a billion dollars a year, which is great. Um, the FEMA's right now has an open call for input on how they should structure um, that program. And one of um, the Nature Conservancy and I know some other organizations that we work with are going to be emphasizing the need to invest in natural infrastructure as part of that program. FEMA already does some of that, but I would say it's not a uh, prevalent use of a lot of their funds, but they have funded floodplain mitigation. Um, they do buyouts. Um, uh, that's uh, definitely um, a common use for some of their mitigation funds. Um, but we do need to see greater investment and greater understanding of uh, the role that natural infrastructure plays in that context. Great. Question and thank you for raising the Disaster Recovery Reform Act. Any any other questions? Great. Hi, um, you spoke to the effectiveness of nature-based uh, solutions to storm sort of buffering. Um, can any of you speak to sort of um, how we have uh, the sort of repair of those ecosystems after a storm compared to hard or gray infrastructure? Like how do they hold up themselves? Uh -huh. Sure. Um, so, sorry, you can't quite hear. Okay, sorry. Um, so we would have done some preliminary uh, monitoring, but the storms that have recently happened, it's sometimes difficult to do um, a very detailed monitoring project in a quick turnaround to get a very um, reliable scientific type result. But many of the projects that were implemented um, in our Florida region, for example, we did have several living shorelines that were impacted um, post by the storms and post storm, it looked like they were still intact. And so, um, just from a you know a very preliminary assessment, so it seems like many of these types of projects do um, do survive the storm. I know there has been a couple of studies on the um, post hurricane impact in some other areas and comparing, uh, in particular, hardened infrastructure and the. Um, nature-based infrastructure, and it, and it did seem that some of the nature-based infrastructure had survived uh, more successfully, and that there was, for example, behind um, some of the um, properties, bulkheads, the erosion had occurred behind it, which is very, you know, this is the opposite of what you want, and that uh, in similar types of areas where living shorelines had been implemented, that hadn't occurred in the same way, so potentially that those, um, having those bulkheads had increase the potential for erosion and there's a few studies on that I'm happy to dig those out and send them to you if you're you're interested but I don't know if you have anything to add there no just um, anecdotal so nothing steady based just that um, natural systems you know tend to take a short-term hit but then um, come back uh, in health pretty quickly, but it's really going to depend on the type of ecosystem and the geography, but generally um, there is a pretty strong regenerative process for natural systems um, and similarly have seen, um, you know, uh, you might take a little bit of degradation, it comes back pretty quickly versus, you know, when you compare to gray infrastructure, there tends to be erosion and scouring and undermining of those structures um, during or after storm events. So similar. And, but and Sarah, right. did, Derek, sorry. I just was curious if um, there, there was a mangrove study showing how um, at least the mangroves protected infrastructure? 
Yeah, I'm not, I know we've done some work on that and I'm not up on, on what the results are, but I've done, I, we did some photograph evidence of areas that were protected by mangroves, but um, yeah, I think our golf program has done some further study on that. Yeah. Sorry, Derek. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I was just going to, again, sort of come back to some policy prescriptions. Two things. I'd put in uh, a plug for engineers. Um, you know, engineers design most hard structures, and uh, engineers sh should be involved in designing risk reduction natural systems, too. Um, I think a lot of times, not a lot of times, but if you want to have distinct protection or, or, or risk reduction, you need to start including some of that engineering values. And, and we've been doing that on beach and dune systems probably more than any other natural coastal system because we've been doing it for 80 years. Um, and then this, this sort of policy prescription of that is, I would say I think this is a, a, big, um, a big need in this community is to be able to have some standardized engineering guidelines and understanding of both the protection benefits as well as the regener regenerative benefits. I know uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is working on that. I think Nature Conservancy is too, but I think I, I would hope that in the next five to ten years we'll have a much better answer to that question rather than just anecdotal. We'll actually have some engineering specifications to say, you know, this type of infra this type of natural infrastructure can provide this much risk reduction and can take this long to uh, return. Um, but we just don't have that yet. Thank you. Any other questions? We are at 4.30, so how about if, if you have additional questions, um, I think our speakers might be able to stay for a couple minutes afterwards. And um, I just uh, want to thank our panel so much. Please join me in, uh, in welcoming our panel. And I want to thank all of you for coming today. And um, also just a reminder, on July 11th, there will be an Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy Expo here in the Rayburn Building in the foyer. So uh, come on down. But thank you. <laughs>